gave Christians a kind of energy, an energy to transform their way of life. They believed. They hoped. And they lived differently because of it. They believed and they hoped. And they lived differently. But you and I, well, we're not exactly holding our breath waiting for Jesus to come and set things right, are we? And consequently, our hopes are small. We don't hope for much, if we hope at all. And so maybe the power that's running our lives these days is not the power of God's Spirit anymore. Maybe the power that runs our lives is something more like the power of the bottom line. Or the power of what other people think. Or the power of what we fear. Maybe it's our fears that run our lives. Or maybe it's the power of what we don't understand. All those things that, that seem to hover over us and dictate who you are and where you have to be and what you have to get done. All those things, all those powers over which you seem to have no control. And we've become resigned to it, haven't we? We've become resigned to life as we currently live it. And we don't expect much to change. We don't plan to see any changes, do we? We don't plan to see any changes for the better. We're resigned to it all. But let me tell you, the early Christians were on the edge of their seats. They were on the edge of their seats. They trusted the power of God in Christ to set the world right. And they lived differently because of that trust. They lived differently because of that hope. But we don't seem to hope for anything close to that. And for us, the, the idea of Christ's return is, is a very strange idea indeed. Do you know that line in the Apostles' Creed that says, He will come to judge the living and the dead, quick in the dead, as those of you who have been around as long as I have used to say, he will come to judge, to judge the living and the dead. Now that's a wake up call. He will come to judge. You and I are going to be judged. Interestingly enough, I want you to hear that as good news. Good news. That's not what we tend to think of when we hear of judgment. For the earliest Christians, the idea of judgment was good news. It wasn't something tragic. It wasn't something depressing. It wasn't horrifying. No. For them, the news that Christ would return, the belief that he will come to judge the living and the dead, that was a message that put a smile on their faces. The word of Christ's return was a word of comfort. It was an expression of encouragement. It was good news because it's the news that the world and everything that's wrong with the world is going to be fixed. It's going to be fixed. Things are going to be made right. A new creation. A brand new creation without war. Without racism. A new creation with no injustice, no poverty, no hunger, no COVID, no Alzheimer's disease, no drug abuse, no broken families, no shootings on university campuses, no terrorism, no weapons. Why, even death will be no more. Now, if that doesn't let us spark hope, I don't know what will. People in the early church reminded each other constantly to watch for the return, to watch faithfully, not in fear, not in trembling, but in eager anticipation. It's not a threat. Judgment is great news. I guess 
What we can really use these days is a new attitude toward the return of Christ. Somehow, we need to recapture that as a focal point to give some, some fresh meaning to our lives. And maybe this season of Advent, maybe this season of Advent can help us to begin to find some of the focus that we need. Advent with this, this emphasis on watching and waiting and preparing. Advent seems to urge us to, to live our lives as though the coming of Christ were just around the corner and to live so certain that God's future is moving toward us, sure and unstoppable. To live so sure that you can live above all the powers that try to run your life. Let yourself be transformed by the power of God. The power of God. Advent kind of nudges us in that direction. Like the early Christian, Advent prompts us to believe and to, to claim a hope and to live differently because of it. The key words in Advent alert, stay awake, be ready, watch. The New Testament idea that Christ is coming soon doesn't mean that he's coming in the next 10 minutes. What it means is that his coming, whenever it is, will be unexpected. Unexpected. So keep awake. Be ready. Watch. That's what people in important, serious circumstances always do. They keep watch. Like soldiers who stand guard while their buddies sleep. Like nurses who are monitoring patients in intensive care units. Like parents who are poised and ready when their toddlers take their very first steps. Or like lifeguards looking for swimmers in distress, or like air traffic controllers studying their equipment as airplanes come and go. It's, it's like that. We live our lives alert and looking for Christ, keeping awake and ready and watching, even as we go about our lives. That's what Advent's about. That's what Advent tells us to do. Have you ever read a book or a magazine while you were watching and waiting for somebody to arrive? You know, maybe at an airport, for example. You're in the airport reading while you wait for somebody to arrive. That may be a good metaphor for Christ's return, something like that. Keeping alert for one thing while at the same time you go on with your regular life. Even as you go through the everyday stuff of life, you live with this backdrop of anticipation of the fulfillment of everything that God has promised. That God has promised. That's the feeling of Advent. And that's why we're here today. First Sunday of Advent. To be awake and be ready and keep alert and, and live in hope above all else. Live in hope. Why? Why should you hope? How can you hope? Just this. Because God is God. God is God. And the whole world is in God's hands.
of our Lord's Supper. So when Jesus was at table with his disciples, he took bread and broke it and gave it to them and said, Take and eat. This is my broken body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So together we eat the bread. Merciful God, calm us down. We rush through the seasons of our lives as though we had a mighty schedule to keep. We plot out our days, minute by minute, crowding each moment with tasks and stresses and pressures. And we begin to notice the growing darkness and anxiety in our lives. We proclaim boldly each year that we will not let ourselves get so caught up and the commercial pressures and demands. And yet, here we are, back in the same old trap of not enough time, not enough energy. The very plans we weave become bonds which imprison us. Lord, in your kindness, hear our prayer. Help us bind ourselves to you, loving God. Help us slow down and reflect on the many ways in which you bless us. Let us drink deeply of your peace. May we cherish the people and the peaceful moments you offer to us. Lift our spirits to remember that you are always with us, offering your healing touch and your compassionate care. Lord, in your kindness, hear our prayer. You are the God of mercy. You bear the hurt of the world. We pray for those for whom joy seems far away. We pray for all whose loneliness is made worse by holiday parties and laughter and other people's joy. We pray for bereaved people still hurting from the death of someone they have loved. We pray for wives and husbands and children whose lives are at a breaking point. We pray for any who live on their own, some of whom will see nobody over Christmas. Lord, in your kindness, hear our prayer. We pray in particular this day for Herb Miller. We pray for Bonnie Sumner and her family and their grief. Pray for the family and loved ones of Marcy Davis in their grief. We pray for Frances Bauer and her family in their grief. We continue to pray for Yvonne Thayer, for Patty Walker Jordan, for Fran Hart, and for Dick Horn. We ask you, O oh God, to touch all of these, and grant them what they most need. Lord, in your kindness, hear our prayer. And hear us, O oh God, as we pray the prayer that we've been taught by Jesus, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
Now let us worship God in the name of our Jesus.
now on the world in peace, as you go, remember, keep the faith, live in hope, and love one another. And may the grace of Christ, the love of God, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with all of you this day.